All right, in this video, we are going to be looking at There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury, one of his most famous short stories. We've already done several of them, so I'm really excited to do this. Is, I think, our fourth Bradbury work on this channel. What are your sound effects doing? That's my rain. It's coming softly into your ears. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> are my, my rain sound effects bad? <laughs> They're about as good as my accents. <laughs> <laughs> and with that... <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina. I am Una. And I am the rain that comes softly crypto. Oh, boy. So this was published in 1950 in Collier's magazine. Uh, it was later included in that, I think it was the same year, if not very soon after, in the Martian Chronicles, which I've never done. I don't think you've ever read that either, have you? No, sir. We will include a link down below to read for free if you would like to check this piece out. All I can say is, oh my gosh, this was so good. There's my there's my rain. So good. Um, is that a number? I, <laughs> I can't, I, I just, I can't put enough on how much this, this resonated with me. So, so this, as you read it, you will for sure see that it picks up with the Sarah Teasdale poem where she kind of writes basically after war, nature's going to wash away stuff and not really care what man did. You piddly little pity humans. Bradbury takes a very different angle with his work, but he, he definitely draws inspiration and includes her poem in his story. Yeah, it's only what, like 12 lines. So it's pretty short and... It fits, I think, very well into the narrative as well. Well, and Teasdale's poem came out well before nuclear weapons existed. And so Bradbury might have, have, have read it and is just like, okay, this is more relevant today than it was when it first came out because this was written several years after the Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki bombings. And what's interesting, too, is just the poetic influence. I'm going to read you a line from this. Okay. The dinner dishes manipulated like magic tricks and in the study a click. That is just so poetic and beautiful, the way that it just flows off of the tongue. But unlike Teasdale and being stoic, Bradbury is very horrific with his approach. Is that a fair? Is that is that not the best way to describe this poem? Is horrific? Yeah, it's it's sad, really sad. There's nothing positive about it, besides that we love it. <laughs> the story allegedly takes place in 2026. When does yours take place? 2026. Now, when it first came out, it was supposed to take place in 1986. Remember, this was just several years after, you know, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki bombings. And there's apparently even some publications that say 2057. Oh, did not know that. So the thing to take away from that is this is supposed to be a future piece. This is this is the 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 warning about what mankind could do to mankind. Is what the point of this purpose is. Is why they keep pushing this off into the future. I believe. Yeah. So he wrote it. Uh, four or five years after the bombing in Japan and setting it far enough into the future. And I think that he was trying to put it far enough into the future, anticipating how technology would change. And I think even he knew that, and I, I, I don't like the 1980s thing, and we're approaching 2026 and we still don't have the technology that is imp that is used in the story. So I, I kind of like the idea of 2057, uh, even more than the 2026. So we jumped into this assuming that it's a nuclear discussion. And I think you and I have the background of Bradbury. We've read, we've read enough of these war stories from him. Yeah. But even if you didn't know that information, if you were just looking at this with blinders on of what is this piece, there's this line, the sun came out from behind the rain. The house stood alone in a city of rubble and ashes. This was the one house left standing at night, the ruined city gave off a radioactive glow, which could be seen for miles. This has to be interpreted as a nuclear discussion, right? Yeah, and the key word there is radioactive. So as maybe a young reader, you can look up that one word, and then that is going to give you some insight to what the rest of the story is going to be about. Well, and you bring up a good point. For younger readers, they may not know the full history of what happened here. There's another quote in the piece that says, the entire west face of the house was black, save for five places. Crypto, my history teacher, educate me on what those five, space, those five uh, spaces could be. So in the story, there are no people, so to speak. And the only remnants of them is their burnt shadows that the bomb has gone off and it's disintegrated them. 
and they were outside enjoying the afternoon and the husband is there the wife is there picking flowers the kids are playing ball and all that's left are these silhouettes of their atoms being smashed into the side of the house and shows them literally uh moving and enjoying their lives when the bomb goes off which is real life like that if you look up hiroshima after effects you will see outlines of people on steps like the last moments of their lives before they are disintegrated which makes this piece very horrific i i think did you know i've been to japan crypto yeah we've talked about that before well when i went to the hiroshima exhibit they actually have like this sandal like it's a wood block with like cloth and that's all that's left and there's an imprint of of a black outline of a foot there of a small little girl and it is absolutely heartbreaking to see humans do this to other humans and 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 what what the horrors were of that day isn't even what he tries to capture in this he shows the after effects like we see the results of the horror in this piece and it, yeah, it's it's a brutal piece. It really is. I mean, it's a it's a gut punch. That's for sure. So we know nu- nuclear war is bad. So what? <laughs> what is this piece trying to convey? Other than we will completely destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons if power goes unchecked. Like, wh- what's the literary thing to take away from this? Do you think? Cautionary tale. I think I think that's easy, right? That, do, that's do, the simple answer. Yeah. Right. So. I think the other thing is is that in this story, being that there are no people, is how a story can be told without people and without dialogue. And this is, I, I almost want to say this is my favorite Ray Bradbury story because of that, mm. because of how, how difficult it would be to write that. I mean, imagine writing a story where your main character is an automatonic house with no people and it makes it very clear in the story that there are no people. There used to be people, and we know that as well. I think that knowing that the setting is the character is like, you get a twofer here. That's incredible. And I think that's the the deeper uh, kind of underlying part of the story that I really enjoyed. Kind of reminds me of the belt with the, like the smart house that can do everything for yeah. you. But okay, let's take, let's, here's, here's another little piece that I like from this. You got the dog that comes back home yeah that is just ridden like particularly for pet lovers that has to be so hard to read and watch the dog collapse and and how the house cleans it up after that and is angry by that too like the little rat things were mad that they had to clean up after the dead decaying radioactive dog well well, here's (laughs) here's what's here's why that is literary a beautiful piece with what he does because because that's horrific What makes it literary? They go to the nursery after this. And in the nursery, they got the pictures of animals on the walls. What I took from this was, this is like an extinction story. Those pictures are all that people will ever see of animals again. In the same way that you look at a picture of a dodo or other animals that are extinct, those pictures are the only things left that keep the memory alive of those creatures. The nursery... Painting a picture of these animals on the wall, that's an extinction picture is what I took from that after like that dog passed away. And then you take it one step further, right? And that the house is the only thing left of people and we're extinct. And then what happens to the house? Like what happens to the dog? Yeah. I think one of the most haunting lines of this piece was it was the children's hour. And to me, this spoke to more, okay, in the moment, Right, they're they're saying that this is the hour that the children play. But from a literary perspective, what he's saying is, this is the children's problem. When you use nuclear weapons in one generation, you don't. The people that are are that get disintegrated, it's not, it's not their problem anymore. Unfortunately, it's the children's problem. It's now the children's hour to figure out what to do and how to move forward. As a, in life, how do, I, how do I make sure the whole world doesn't end up like those shadows on the wall? And I think that's why the children's hour, the children's generation story here is what makes it literary to discuss. All right, so walking away from this, there's one final quote here. The fire burned on the stone hearth 
and the cigar fell away into a mound of quiet ash on its tray. So if you didn't know, there is actually a flame of peace burning in Hiroshima. I went there. I will show a picture that I took while I was there. But uh, it was lit on August 1st, 1964, and it will burn eternally until all nuclear weapons are abolished. And it's very, very sad. You'll, I'll show up another picture. But while we were there, a young Japanese schoolboy came up to my wife and I, and he gave us a crane, a Japanese symbol of peace. peace yeah. and, and it was really heartbreaking <laughs> as the culture that, that caused this atrocity to have a small school boy come up and give us a crane was, it was hard. It was hard. So I would say, honestly, for Hiroshima, anyone that's in the area, would, would it be worth checking out? Yeah, I think this story is more relevant than ever now as a cautionary tale to uh, nuclear proliferation. It's, uh, it's, it's scary. It is scary, yeah. and it, it it paints that living in fear picture. Yeah, it, it really does. You you could probably tell. I get I get a little choked up right now. It's yeah. it's it's how can we do this to each other? And 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 I've seen it firsthand, and it's terrifying. I know, and it and it's it's more relevant to today. A story like this of you know we're the ones that we we have the power, and we do it to ourselves. And I think that was what. Ray was trying to say is, and he did it with no people, right? Because people are the enemy here. Right. We it are was, our own worst was, enemy. The after effects are the surrogates to explain the horrors yeah. of what we did. All right, let's jump into ratings here. Crypto, why don't you go first? <sighs> so I know you want me to replace this one <laughs> and this one to be the best. And this is our last hope. Our last hope. Yeah. It's not going to win, ah, so to right. speak. Fair enough. But Fair enough. I will let it tie for second place. I would give this a beautiful 9.5, my gift to you. Oh, that's very, as you hear me start yeah. to get a little choked up over here. Um, yeah. So, so I'm going to have to go with a 9.5 as well. So... Let me jump back to what you said. So this is tied for second place. So you've got Harrison Bergeron as your favorite your favorite story of all time. Second place, Short story. Short story, sorry. Yeah. And in second place, we now have There Will Come Soft Rains, which is tied with A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. Yeah. Wow. So we did pretty good. We found a very strong two runner-ups. But, I mean, Signs and Symbols, right up there. That one was amazing. I loved that one. And what was the one that we just did last week? Come on, it's your favorite food. <laughs> My favorite food. I liked Arby's. Oh, Arby. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was, like, I was thinking of food in the story. <laughs> no, this has been this has been an amazing month of of great selection. This is this has been our most successful month of these are the best reads we've done so far, I feel like, of this channel. We could write a short story. We could call it January. <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps we'll revisit this plan again for a whole month dedicated to to short stories. Perhaps, but maybe, maybe every January can become our thing. Perhaps, but but first we must return to the Dark Tower as a part of your 2020 goals to reach the Dark Tower. Gotta reach the Dark Tower, man. We're gonna be picking up the wastelands, and we'll be announcing what else we will be reading in the month of February. Hint. Well, I mean, is it really that big of a guess? I, I don't know what BookTube does in February, but I know what schools talk about a lot in February. <laughs> hint, hint. It's going to be related to that. Yeah. What What does every school have to teach during February? Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for checking out our channel. I really hope you appreciate the talk as much as we did today. If you did, please consider subscribing for more literature discussions. We think literature is worth discussing more so than just saying, I liked it. <laughs> and be kind to one another out there. Be nice. Smile. It costs nothing. <laughs> All right, guys. Peace out. <laughs>